everybody for being here. And so before we get started, I just want to kind of review um, what the goal is today. So it hasn't been the prettiest rollout of this incident management system, right? We uh, just to kind of backtrack, give you a little bit of a story of context. We um, obviously there was a, a need, right? The city went through a process of accreditation and evaluating our needs, and they identified that hey, we need some means to train and have a continual process of evaluation for company officers. That's at the engine company level, truck company level, and up through chief officer. Just uh, just to be able to kind of exhibit that, uh, be able to show uh, confidence from year to year. Um, and this was the solution. They investigated it, they came back, and said, hey, this might be something that we uh, will work in our fire department. And so they went about the process of, of getting buy-off. It was distributed to some of the chief officers, uh, union members, and they went through the program. After they went, kind of went through the online portion, they came back and said, hey, yeah, this is something that I think will work for us, we'll kind of meet those requirements. Uh, for the deficiency found in uh, accreditation, and um, it'll be good for us. It'll give us a platform that we can all speak the same language, that we can all operate the same way, and uh, have a platform for training new hires and people wanting to promote up and getting them on the same page with everyone else. Um, fast forward, um, that was uh, Brian, he went to the train the trainer class, he was one of the first, brought it back, went through that process, and then, um, uh, I came into the training department and we started to roll it out, right? So we did that first session, second session, um, after we did the online portion. So we had the online portion and then we got together and it was like, hey, you know, what are we doing? You know, Phoenix, they don't do vertical ventilation. They have these, this stuff and that stuff. Are we doing that? We tried to clear that up on the first session saying, okay, so, you know, probably should have the session first, but we cleared all that up. Um, and we rolled out the uh, reporting conditions and we rolled out the um, 360. And that's where we kind of left it, right? We did started on some sets and reps, COVID, the height of COVID, um, had some problems or not problems, but maybe disagreements or things to iron out. And so here we are kind of 18 months later. Um, since then, we've been able to meet with our chief officers to sit down and kind of iron out um, anything that needed to be fixed um, and address any issues. And the result of that meeting is, yes, this is the system we're doing and we're rolling it out. We're not going to piecemeal the system into something that doesn't look like uh, that program at all. We're gonna roll it out and then we're all, we all have buy-in. So that's the direction. That was the direction from our fire chief. That's the direction from Chief 2, Chief 3. And then they gave direction to uh, Chief 4, my boss, and said, hey, and then now Ryan and I are in a position to kind of go ahead and roll out the training for everyone. And so that's what we're here to do today. So because we've had this interim, this 18 month period where we've had that period of not being engaged in it, or maybe we forgot some of the pieces or become unpracticed in it, or maybe it's not part of our normal repertoire because we're not sitting in that front seat, um, that's what we're here to do today. The goal today is a review of the pieces that we've already introduced, kind of a summation of that, and then where we're going. Like, what is blue card? Uh, what does that mean to us? What does the totality of the system look like? And how does it end? Just that whole communication model rounded out. And then finally, uh, what we want to address is just where we're going with it. Like, yeah, we're going to try to round this communication model out and answer any questions you might, you might have. And that's the part of the reason we need to get together. If there is, is stuff that you've heard over the last 18 months, or, and we've heard quite a bit, so we'll bring up those issues too and talk about them. But if you yourself have something that we need to talk about, let's talk about it. And let's address it and just get it to where we're all, um, you know, thinking about the same thing. And then the last point is just where we're going with the training. We have this piece, we have this MCD, sets and reps, policies, those all need to be adjusted. And uh, as you can imagine, it's a, it's a beast of a program. It's not just these MCDs, this is like the, the, the tiniest portion 
the sets and reps is a big portion, but even bigger is those accompanying policies and procedures that go along with. You can imagine, like one policy, you just change a word with one policy, it kind of filters through four or five different other policies. And that's the situation that we're in now. Um, some of our stuff, you know, right now, this is a good thing, right? It allows us to kind of review and um, examine what we do have, eliminate stuff that's old, bring it up to speed so we're all on the same page. So I think there's just a couple of portions there. You know, uh, Chief Delory came in and kind of told uh, that, you know, this is collectively from Chief One to the entire third floor to all our battalion chiefs that this is the direction that we're going with. And I know that oftentimes Scott and I might seem like we're the salesmen of this and we're trying to sell this product on you, but we're selling it to you because we're the teachers of it. And that's the way that we're, we're invested in it. Uh, we, we see the value in it and we're here to try to sell it to you and also try to, to answer the questions. So that's one of the big reasons that we're here again today. Now, what we've done so far, I'm not saying it didn't work, but it isn't a great model, right? We introduced something 18 months ago then we took like a six month break, and then we took another six month break and we're here. And I know that isn't, that doesn't work. We can't expect you to remember the information. We're kind of in this limbo stage right now, like we've been taught something and where some people are applying it and not everybody's applying it. And we're gonna do our part to, to fix that problem. You're we're gonna see that moving forward, blue card is our red card, officer training is going to be the norm. Uh, pretty much every month you are going to see an officer training on the calendar. It is our number one priority. We know that what we've done so far probably isn't ideal and hasn't worked, and we need to correct that, and the way that we can correct it is with consistency. We can't teach you something today and expect that three months from now that you retain it, and then three months later. So we're gonna fix that. So every month you're gonna see officer training on the calendar. You also might see new modified versions of officer training. Because when we start doing sets and reps, it's, it's typically about five units that we need to do, that you're gonna fill about five different, six, seven different positions. Uh, and that's it, so a 30 person MCD isn't gonna do any good for sets and reps when six people are doing work and you know 20 are sitting around. So what we're probably gonna do is see modified uh, MCD groups where maybe it might be just two, three, four officers or engines with their officers coming in to really get those sets and reps. The sets and reps things has been this mythical thing that we've told you about, right? That everything's gonna be solved when we start doing sets and reps. Our next session is sets and reps. It's where we can really start putting it in. Uh, Scott uh, has been really working diligently to have their, their great simulators. You're in front of a computer, you're wearing a headset, you have a push to talk, you're watching simulations, you're actually seeing what's going on, you're responding as if you were that individual on that unit. So it puts all the pieces together. So we're gonna do our best to keep this momentum moving. I know that we asked for support in the program, we got support in the program, and our part is now to keep that momentum going on. And we, we, uh, we feel that we can, and the way that we can is with just keeping going with these sessions. We know that, yes, Chief. Can I? Of course. So, so. I'm just gonna chime in a little bit. We've got the opportunity to um, evaluate this blue card system thoroughly, and I personally, you know, we all believe in it. I think we're gonna be a better department by going to just continue with sets and reps. So I'm going to encourage you guys all to embrace it. Uh, listen to the radio frequently, and uh, I'm hearing that you guys are already embracing it. Um, so I'm just looking forward to us continuing this process. Um, I'm committed to the continuous quality improvement of our organization, and this represents that. So um, please ask a lot of questions uh, so that you guys can understand this. Process. Thank you, Chief. Perfect. So that's why we're here today. And what we need to be, like if we're objective-based people, we need to be able to leave here today with our answers, either an our questions answered or at least addressed. Because our next session is we're moving forward. And that is that is the goal, that we are doing sets and directives the next session. So we should walk away from here with the good working knowledge. Scott and I are always available. Uh, this is the forum. Uh, throughout today, we're gonna you're gonna hear this is what they do. I would like to, every time you hear they, consider the word we, okay? The, when we talk about the blue card, it is our blue card. This is what we're gonna do. Now, everything that you hear that might be a change, I think we're gonna try to support it with why we feel that it's a significant change. And not why it's a significant change 
from the Brunacini's viewpoint or the Phoenix Fire Department's viewpoint, but every one of you sitting in the seat and why it would be an important change for us, for your safety, the department's safety, the way that we're just taking what we're already doing and doing it a little bit better. And so we're gonna try to point that out. And like, like, uh, like Chief Burton said, this is the forum to ask questions. If this is the forum, if you have heartache, if you have issues, because once again, we understand that this is gonna be a difficult process. And what I mean by difficult is it's, it's, we're gonna do things a little bit differently. We have some like old dog, new dog tricks, whatever that phrase is. We have some old dogs, right? They've been doing stuff, no, no offense. I wasn't looking at anybody directly in here. We're there are some people that three in the morning push the push to talk and stuff just comes out of their mouth and it is perfect every single time. And we're not saying what they're, what they're doing is wrong. We also have some individuals in here that they are new. We've got Miguel right here who will, who will be our, you know, our next engineer, right? Our next. And, uh, and this individual is actually what blue card, rib card is ideal for. You know, we had Miguel here today, we had Jesse Norton here the other day, we had Mike Dobbins. Those are the ideal individuals, the ideal individuals, the promoted individuals, Captain Hoffman here sooner than later, uh, the ideal individuals that Blue Card is built for. Because we have a system now that we can have these people sit down in that engine the first day as a captain and have already ran numerous simulations. Be prepared. We have a brand new engineer that the very first day when they sit in the engine and they are then thrown into that AC role, the first minute of the first day that they are actually prepared for that job. And uh, I think you can see the benefit in that. So some of the older dogs, there's some new tricks to learn. Some of the newer dogs, there's some, there's some uh, tricks to learn. And uh, I think all in all, uh, we're here today to kind of get us up to speed so that we're all talking the same language. You know, Chief Delore made, and I could talk for way too long, but Chief Delore made the mention of six different fire departments, right? That expression's been thrown out as long as I've been here. Now, we will always have six different fire departments as long as you have six different personalities as species. I understand that, and we'll never get a program where we can convert people's personalities to all be alike. But the one thing that we can work on is that their communication on the fire ground is the same. And remember, that is what Blue Card is. We're not changing personalities, we're not changing <coughs> tactics, we're using a communication model. And I believe that if you ask anybody that works in the fire service, is there any value of having six different departments doing six things six different ways, every one of them would throw up a red flag, correct? that that is something that needs to be corrected. And Blue Card, I think, is the first step in correcting that, at least that we all talk the same way. And just remember, if you, haven't, if you don't remember anything from Blue Card, that Blue Card is a communication model, first and foremost. It's not the Phoenix Fire Department, it's not Phoenix Tactic, it is everything that we already do, all the tactics, all the ways that we put out fires, just talking, and using a communication model that we all talk the same way. All right, Scott. All right, so here we go. So we've already kind of talked about um, these points, right? We've completed the online portion. We've had that sessions one and two. We rolled out the initial rate of report, uh, initial report of conditions, the follow-up report, and today just that session three, which we just summarized, just that total picture of what it looks like. We'll try to do our best to summarize that, give you the best picture, but understand that there's other pieces and this is a lecture and sometimes things get missed in translation. So we'll do our best to try to explain the different parts and then um, just know that additional training, the goal of the additional training is to just complete everything, to really kind of cement it in our minds and make it into a reality. So a review. So here's the, here's the thing that we're gonna, we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about what blue card and then when, it, when it's not blue card. Um, these are our points. So we'll first talk about command. And again, these are very basic ground level rules that make the overall system work better. Um, and these are by and large stuff that we are doing right now. Uh, first point there is just the first right you're new to the member. They're responsible for completing the eight functions of command. Now the next slide is a summary of those eight functions of command. You can think back to your online training. We do those online functions. We do those eight uh, command functions right now. It's not 
something that is a mystery. We do that on every single call. Um, where blue card focuses is on the communication piece. And you'll hear that uh, time and again. Um, so we're gonna assume command, we complete the A functions of command. More than likely, the first in company officer, probably that engine company officer, will be the first one to assume the role of mobile command, that number one IC. Uh, they're expected to assume, do a report of conditions, broadcast that report of conditions, assign a few units, complete a 360, and if need be, if the incident is expanding, then transfer it to a strategic command, our battalion chiefs. We'll take over the incident and then continue running the call. Um, but that mobile command, and we'll talk about this, it's the mobile command by and far, they want that person to be inside with their crew, not outside. They want them to be mobile, do that front front side of the incident, and then join their crew in order to take care of the most important problem, the actual emergency. Um, and we'll talk about some of the variations of that and uh, maybe some issues that came up with that a little bit later. Um, that next point is that command should only be transferred if it's needed. Um, if it's a working fire, we're going to transfer command. I think it's we're pretty good at that. If there's an incident that is expanding and your efforts are best uh, concentrated on the problem, then that's where we need to be and we're gonna transfer command to that second IC. Um, but if it's a smaller incident, if it's just that light smoke showing or no smoke showing, and that mobile command is taking care of the problem and there's just no need to transfer it, then they would say, just keep it. Because you are in the best position to mitigate that problem. You're in the investigation mode, you can identify it, you can put the pieces where you want. When it gets more complicated, that's, that's a reason to kind of have somebody else step outside of your area to get that global picture. Um, the next point there is that command is only transferred to someone physically on scene. A strategic command is not going to assume the incident while they're driving in, while they're on the freeway, while they're on the road, when they're several blocks out, none of that. They have to be physically on scene in order to assume command. And there's a very good rational reason for doing that. When you give them a report of conditions or you do a transfer of command, they need to be on scene to see what you're talking about. You're the best piece of uh, best piece of you know the pie right now. You you have all the information. You're able to arrive first, evaluate the problem, get a total picture by doing a 360, put units in place based upon your observation, and then now you're going to transfer command to that second IC, and they have to physically be there in order to verify what you're seeing. You could still be in that command mode and inside with your crew, but now you've got that IC you're doing the transfer command with, and they need that total picture too. And the only place they can do that is on scene. Um, an IC in the strategic uh, position, kind of last point on this slide, is that they have to be either inside or at the back of their command vehicle. Um, that's where they would want them all the time. Now, we're not saying that there aren't those, you know, small instances where it's just, you know, that IC maybe needs that face-to-face -face contact to a problem that's just so complex, we can't describe it over the radio, that we need to have that face-to-face. -face. But what this is talking about is our, by and large, all of our incidents that appear to be standard in nature, we employ standard operations and we have a standard outcome. There's just no need for the IC to be wandering around the scene, they need to be out of vehicle. And then kind of like the main point for that is that's the best place that they can perform accountability, listen to the radio, kind of detach from the chaos of an incident into a quieter area where they can manage the scene. And once again, every time we say they, we understand that's we, right? They say that blue card says this, but then we can agree that we need this. And remember, none of these things that you see on the screen are chipped in stone. You might see some aggressive language like, 
Command should not be transferred unless it improves. Command is only transferred. Now we know that there is always a rare circumstances. We know doing this job that there are dynamic situations that are the exception. But far, the norm should be that we only transfer command when it improves the, the, when it needs to be. And where is the, who drives that? The battalion chief arriving on scene. If they feel that they can improve the command structure, then they are going to transfer command. Now, let's just take one step back and understand where we fit into the puzzle. Every person in here with a blue shirt, what position are you going to fill? Mobile command or strategic command? Mobile. We will always be mobile command. Blue shirts are always going to be mobile command. Black shirts are going to be what? Strategic command. Now, we're not saying that there, there's some hierarchy there. It's that we have a role and they have a role. Now, there are seven working structure fires in the city right now, and you arrive on scene. Guess what? You are going to be mobile command. You're never going to be relieved, probably, of that by strategic command. Now, that doesn't say that, hey, this once in a lifetime, maybe anomaly, that you might have to stay outside and run the entire incident knowing you're not going to get any help. But you will always be mobile command. And we will always be mobile command until it is transferred to strategic command. We agree? Or we understand that role? Now, there's some things that come across this. Uh, when it talks about that, you know, you might assign the first two or three engine companies. Now, understand, the first two or three engine companies is a burden that we have to deal with as mobile command. But that's an incredible burden that we have to deal with, right? Why is it a burden that, that we have to assign the first two or three engine companies? Because we're fortunate that we have two or three engine companies back to back arriving on our scenes that fast. There's plenty of places that they don't have to deal with that, correct? We have that burden because we know that 95% of our calls, we are going to have a pile of resources within those first few minutes. We also understand that on the majority of the calls, we're going to have a BC that either beats us to being on scene or is close behind us. So when we talk about running the incident in a mobile command position and giving a report on conditions and doing a 360 and assigning those first few resources that you have arriving on scene, that's what we've already always done, correct? The only big change is that we, I think we all agree that the best place for a captain is with their crew. I think every one of you of officers understands that your best role is with your crew. Some would even argue that's what we get paid to do, correct? Is to manage the accountability and the direction of our crew. Also, can you not, would you also agree with me that you have seen the fire from the very onset. You were the first resource that got there. You saw it at the very first second. You've done a 360, you've seen multiple exposures and multiple sides of the structures, and now you're inside the structure fighting fire with your crew. You're by far the most valuable asset, and the best place you can be is right there doing that mobile command position and staying in that position. Because you've seen it from the outside, you've seen it from all sides, and now you're seeing it from inside. And that is what we are gonna build upon with this, with this program. All right, so the next slide is just a, a, another review slide of just those eight punches of, of command that we talked about in the previous slide. Um, just deployment, right? So this is our, we have a response pattern. We have you know, a normal amount of units that we automatically assign to a structure fire, that we assign to a freeway fire, that we assign to a high rise fire, that we assign all these. That's our deployment, right? Um, and then when we arrive, we have an assumption, a confirmation, and then a positioning of those units. We evaluate the situation. Um, we develop a strategy and an IAP. And then we communicate. We have a system of communication between all those units and our dispatching center. We have an organization that we work at, mainly the ICS system. And then with that system, we do a, a process of a reviewing, evaluating, and revising the IAP based upon the needs of the incident. And then based upon those needs, we just continue to support um, and then ultimately terminate the ICS. The, this is exactly what we do. The, the area, like I said before, the area that uh, Blue Card focuses and which is now gonna be our focus is that communication piece. That communication model and getting everybody on the same page. As far as these other systems or functions of command, 
These are the same functions of command that we do with every incident and we'll continue to do. Anything about that? Yeah, just, we know that there's no change to tactics. Our, our standard response plane does not change with blue card. Really, we can main five, and then it maybe carries over just a little bit into six there with the organization and some of the pieces. Remember, blue card or RIV card is entirely based on the ICS system. The basic I-200 class that you took at the fire academy, the fundamentals of that is everything that this is built upon. Simple span of control and complexity, and building and contracting, or expanding and contracting based upon it. With the systems of accountability, by strict accountability and communications in order to make all that stuff better. Okay, so another little piece there on the command side is uh, we prefer no, especially in the beginning phases of the incident, like no face-to-face. -face. There's really, and if you're in the mobile command position and you're assigning two or three units, there's really no need because we have several tactical objectives. And you've got a couple of sheets in front of you, right? We've got some templates there. Um, these are made into, and we just picked them up today uh, during our lunch break, is the whiteboards. Everybody is gonna get assigned a whiteboard. They're gonna be given one. That's to be used as for training purposes, um, here when you're in training or at your station, or you can use it as a tactical worksheet when you're doing your initial you know, mobile command duties. Or even um, you know, if you have to step out and do uh, division, division responsibilities, you can flip it over and use the backside as your uh, units, you know, status, assign, you know, that whole thing. But um, we would say that, especially in the initial throws, when we know exactly what we need to do, there's just no need to pause and face to face, especially if it's gonna be in the strategic command. You really should be monitoring the radio in that kind of like that area that's not in the hot zone or warm zone, you know, out of that area, and there's really no new information. Now we're not saying that there's not, you know, that small percentage of circumstances where, again, like we said before, that there's just, you need that face-to-face -face interaction in order to describe something so complex that it's gonna get lost over the radio. But by and large, if the IC contacts me or if I'm in mobile command and I contact another unit, it's you're being assigned to fire attack and primary search from the alpha side to attack a fire on the Charlie side or you're being assigned to vent, need you to get back to me with a roof report. I need you to establish a rig cash control utilities, you'll be on deck for iRig. It's real simple. We're operating on command two, TAC four. That's their simple, straightforward communication that goes along with our tactical priorities. Um, next point there, hazard zone communication was performed on tactical channel, that's our model. Um, you know, we have a two-channel radio system. Uh, Phoenix does not. They have a one-channel system, and that kind of solves certain issues for them. But this is a system that we worked with for a long time, and our partners around us, they have the similar system, and that's what we're working with. Um, we operate on scene in the IDLH. We're operating on a tactical channel. Um, also, in the position of strategic command, if multiple radios are employed or you're using multiple radios, it's best practice if you know the scene is expanding and you've got more units and maybe you assign a division now, get a command partner in there to assign and assist with managing the radio. And we'll talk about that later. We'll talk about the accountability policy, we'll talk about radio, we'll talk about that command partner and what they can do for the BC at the command post. Just kind of shedding some of that responsibility or shedding some of that burden, taking on some of that burden so the IC can really concentrate on commanding the incident. Um, the next point there is that we're gonna use a strategic decision-making model. This is that same model, like during the online course, that you probably saw 10 times. Like after each of the courses, you saw it over and over and over again. Uh, we'll get to look at that on the next slide. But uh, the last point there is that first engine company or the first unit, it could be a truck, it just depends, um, or the BC respond directly to the scene. 
all other units level one or level two. Level one and level two is an assignment. And this is mobile command goal. If you arrive on scene and you're the first in officer, you need 30 seconds to do a report of conditions and get out of your unit and evaluate the situation. That's why this is so nice. You have a level one. If you look, you do a snapshot, you do a report of conditions, and you know exactly what to do, no problem. Those units are right on level one. They check in with you. Engine one, level one. Engine two, level two, or level one, no problem. Engine two, you're assigned to this right away. But at least it gives the opportunity for that mobile command to have a moment to evaluate the situation and then start making some assignments. Um, I think we're doing this, you know, pretty well right now. Any questions on this, like level one? And also, we're just we're using the terminology level one. It's been uh, brought up in um, other classes. Just you know, how are we going to interact with Cal Fire? You know, they use different terms. They may not know what level one. If they come into our city and we say, "Hey, level one," are they going to know what that means? And uh, it was brought up. Um, by others that, you know, maybe if we show up to their scene and they ask us to go to Buck, what's that? What's Buck? Backup crew. All right, backup crew. That's what it is. So I never heard that. I wouldn't know, but I think common sense would tell me that if I didn't know what that was, I'd just say, yeah, copy that I see. What's Buck? Oh, that's that. You're the backup crew. You're right outside the door. You're just in front of the residence, out the side. Oh, thanks. And that's every second new engine on a Cal Fire Edison is assigned buck. Because when you have a three-person engine company, guess what you got to have? A buck crew. So there, are, there is different terminology out there. We agree. And level one works because it is an assignment. Is it the same thing as going on scene? Definitely. But we level one. That's an assignment, and you wait for an assignment. Now. We are all incredibly intelligent people in here. And with that, there's some forward thinking. If it is a working fire, and Scott is mobile command, and he has his hands full, and you call and you level one, what should your crew start to do? Get ready to go to work, right? Because you know you're gonna get an assignment. So we're just not gonna send the fire engines, we're gonna start going to work. But we're starting to get ready to work, waiting for that assignment, knowing that I'm either gonna be assigned on deck or I'm gonna be going to work. On the opposite, Scott, he has nothing. He's on the investigation mode. He know, we look, we don't see anything. We can get from his report on conditions. So we're gonna level one what? Probably one or two houses down, right? We're gonna sit in the cabin, wait for that assignment, wait for him to come back. Yeah, there's nothing. We got a smoke detector. We got food on the stove to be released. That's where that forward thinking and us just listening, which is once again, everything that we're already doing as it is. We're gonna really start talking about that command partner, uh, in the accountability, like Scott said, and how, once again, all of this is based upon is complexity. When you, as a engine company, cannot perform your task, whether it's because the house is too big or the fuel loading is too much, or there's just, I can't, the, my skill level, my crew that day, whatever variable, all you're gonna do is tell the IC, I need help. I can either do my job, or I need help. That's the basic, and for a lot of us, that's a beautiful place to be, right? I was assigned one task, I had one task to do, and I either can accomplish it, or I can't and I need help. Same thing when it comes to a lot of these, when well, we're gonna see how that concept builds forward. But level one and level two, um, everybody heard the word IC, or uh, fire scope compliant, uh, ICS 500, NIOSH compliant, I'll tell you right now that everything that we're telling you today is fire scope compliant. There's nothing in fire scope that says that you have to stay on scene. There's nothing that says that you can't use the word level one, level two. If anything, we're gonna talk about a few things that are dr dramatically fire scope compliant that we're gonna use that are directly in alignment with ICS 500, NIOSH standards. Uh, so hopefully the, everything uh, is, is confirmed. There's nothing that we're gonna tell you that's gonna put anybody in safety, jeopardize, uh, any of our strategic goals, whether it is fire suppression, life uh, safety, uh, incident stabilization. So rest assured, and we'll, we'll address all those as we move forward. Okay, so here is just that uh, strategic decision-making model. 
starting with those critical fire ground factors that we saw in previous slides, those eight factors, which leads to a risk management plan. We take, we evaluate those things, and then we develop a strategy out of that. And from that strategy, we develop an IEP. And then based upon that IEP, we employ our tactical priorities and our policies that we have within our fire department in order to meet the need of the incident. And then it goes back to the critical ground factors, like fire ground factors, right? Like, is it meeting the need? And then we go through that evaluation process and then it just goes round and round and round. Just that continual process of evaluating, looking at those elements, develop an IAP, revise it if need to be, and then um, moving on. So we've probably seen this a dozen times, right? Like over and over, we've seen this picture. All right, next. So we talked a little bit about staging, that level one, level two staging. We're not gonna go in too in depth for the first two points, um, but just to kind of resummarize that, you know, there's a reason for it. We just don't, it's because it produces an organized incident command system. There's no freelancing, nobody's just jumping out of the rig and then rushing the scene. It's, uh, I know where I'm gonna get to work, I know what I'm probably gonna do, I'm gonna prepare for that, and then I'm gonna get my assignment and then go to work. But I'm gonna wait for that mobile command or IC or second IC to give me an assignment. Um, and then kind of along the lines are related to that battalion chief not being able to assume a command from any other place except physically on scene, the same applies to every unit. A engine company, a truck company cannot receive a, um, a task, location, or objective until they get into level one or level two stages. They have to be physically on scene. Um, and then once they are, they're there, they get assigned, uh, they're deployed into the IDLH, it, um, and the whole management system revolves around accountability. Um, and then those working cycles, obviously, were just tied to an air pack, right? So, those whole cycles are just tied to the amount of air and how quickly we breathe down the air, that's it. Real simple. Um, but we're defining as our, our accountability as having three levels. The first level is the strategic level, which is that um, I see at the command post working a tactical worksheet and then uh, making sure that all the pieces, you know, he knows where all the pieces are. The next level is just the accountability tax with that tactical level. It's just like each of those units, who's on those units, and I have those at the command post. The last level is, is me and it's, it's you. It's that voice to voice, face to face, uh, touch presence of keeping everybody accountable together as a crew. That's our job. And so those three levels together create a really good accountability system. We're relying the IC number two, the strategic command, is relying on the company officer to keep their crew together and not separate them. If one person's out of air and the other two have plenty, well then we're all coming out together. Now don't mistake that there are some uh, you know, operational needs to separate crew. You know, that happens. But when we're working together, we're working together. That first in officer, this, that first in company, the engineers are going to be pumping. They're going to be at the pump, pumping hose lines. But then that leaves the three crew members or the two crew members. That is the unit. And then those three or two stay together. And then if they go in together, they come out together. And that's that accountability piece. The BC has their tactical worksheet. They're managing it, describing where everybody is. They have the pass tags moving them around on the board as to where they are in the IDLH or recycling or rehabbing, whatever, wherever they may be. And then, um, and then the last piece is just insured by the company officer who says, yeah, I'm in the IDLH, I'm out of the IDLH, I need to recycle, just that communication piece. So let's break that down specific on an incident. So a captain has accountability of his crew. I think we all agree that that's their job, right? A captain needs to understand where their crew members are at all times. And even if we split crews, we still have an understanding, right? If, you know, if engine two were to be first due, 
we know that my engineer is at the pump panel and then I have myself and my firefighter are going to work. So my accountability is of those two right now. If all four of the crew members go in, if all three of the crew members, that's a captain's job. And that is through voice, vision, and touch. We agree with that. Now, we have this next level, which is that tactical accountability and strategic accountability using the passport tax or the, with the unit accountability tax. We do a real good job of putting our names on those passport tags every morning, right? We take that little one and we put it on the passport tag, but from that point forward, we don't do a whole lot with those things. We do really good getting, getting them filled out every morning, putting a little piece of tape on there or collecting all the people, uh, but from that point forward, we don't. And I think we would all agree that it's a captain's responsibility to keep track of their crew and it's the IC's responsibility to keep track of all the units on the incident. And this is what Blue Card is built upon, is the fact that the next radio communication is a mayday. Don't underestimate that. Now, we don't build this system for success, we build it for the worst case scenario on a given day. That if we had a mayday right now, we need to know exactly where that person is. And that's what the accountability system is made for. And I think we'd all agree that we could probably do a little bit better job on that on our accountability system. Now I know that some people call this uh, uh, personnel tracking, and some people call this accountability. And I don't know where the difference between the two are, because I would argue that they're the same. Do, is, this, is this personnel tracking on the incident? Of course it is. Is this accountability? Of course it is. But what we need to do is we need to know where everybody is at any given time. So we do that through, uh, through, uh, through a very, I think, logical plan, and this one mimics our existing accountability plan and the county's accountability plan. And, and let, me, let me kind of describe it. So first do, all right, we have engine three over here. Engine three is first do. That is gonna be the original accountability location, correct? Because that's that first do. So engine three gets on scene, and until a VC arrives, that's gonna be the accountability location. So whether it's engine three, and then maybe truck three, and then maybe engine nine arrive, all of those uh, unit accountability attacks are gonna end up on the seat of the first two engine. One, we already, remember we talked about that, the accountability location is broadcasted on the 360 report. 99% of the times it's always probably gonna be that really easy first two engine with the hose being pulled off of it, right? Each one of us, we put that on the captain's seat, job is taken care of. All of a sudden, down the road, now the BC arrives. We've got strategic location, right? Across the street, you know, hopefully here pretty soon, the tailgate and the truck is wide open. You know, we've got a brand new BC rigs. They got their boards out there ready to go to work. Our biggest thing that we need to figure out is how we get those tags from engine three seat over to the BC's with rep. That's the piece we've got to figure out. And I think we're all pretty much we're going to figure out. If McGill's pumping by that time, maybe things are a little bit stabilized. I can run those over to the chief real fast. If the chief has a second, he can run over. We need to figure that out. But now, where's accountability? It's now on the BC rig. And what the BC has is they have all of those accountability tags. And all they're doing is moving those tags around as we broadcast to them our location. So we talked about status change, right? So I was assigned division one for fire control. I need to recycle because I'm out of air. I told the BC, hey, engine three needs to recycle. Perfect, the BC comes back, uh, recycle back to deck. He takes that tag from inside the house, puts it into recycle, puts it onto deck. And all they're doing is moving these ponds around, correct? And at any given time, they know where you're at. That's why this blue card system, we always want things to be a division and never a group. You can, if you remember that kind of from the, because divisions are geographical. I know exactly where you are. If I assign truck to vent, I have no idea where they're at. I know they're somewhere, they're doing a function, but I want geographical as opposed to truck two, you're gonna be assigned to roof for ventilation. They're assigned, they're unit designator, they're assigned to the roof. If anything happens to truck two, I hear a mania, where am I gonna look? To the roof. And that's how that works. Now, RBCs are really good at what they do. They can, they're, they're smart, they can manage a bunch of stuff. First alarm, managing those things, probably no problem, right? What happens when you start getting a second alarm? Third alarm. Now all of a sudden that BC is trying to manage how many accountability tasks. Now that becomes difficult. 
That's where the command assistant, the accountability officer, is a perfect designation. The IC requests, hey, I need someone off your crew. Hey, the next due engine, I want your engineer, I want your captain, I want someone to be my accountability officer. Where would that person probably be standing? Right next to the VC, right? The VC's on, in the wagon, they got the board out, the VC's on the radio talking. What's, what's, the, what's the accountability officer done? What's the assistant? Move it. VC asks who, hey, who do I got on deck? You got engine two, engine three, engine four. All right, take engine three, we're putting them on the road. Bam, 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 all they're doing is moving that the entire time. The same thing, the argument that we hear sometimes about the system is that officer development isn't gonna occur anymore. Because what would we do in the past? We would allow you to run the entire incident the whole time. The, one of the benefits of this system is that officer development still, it's just not gonna be that first due captain. Because that second due, the third due captain, the one that we wanna mentor, the one that take the next up, what a perfect position is to have them come in and be the strategic command assistant. They're right there in the shadows of the, B, of the, the BC. They're doing uh, strategic command, they're overhearing, they could even be broadcast on the radio, they're helping with accountability. So, it's not that the BC couldn't handle it, it's that when things get complex enough, we expand. And that's all it is. So, that is the accountability system, and I hope that all of us here, when we think to ourselves, man, this sounds like a pretty good system. One, I think you should all, I would think, because I do, I think it's completely manageable. It's manageable for us. Our biggest thing is that when we get off the rig, we need to have that accountability tag. We need to be programmed that when we leave the rig, guess what our hand grabs? The accountability tag. If, if the BC isn't there yet, where am I gonna drop it off on? First two. If, if the BC is there, what do I gotta do? I get my assignment, here you go, we go to work. That's it. The BCs, their job is to move those things around constantly and always know wherever one of our resources is at. And I think that is manageable, and that is, not that I think it's manageable, it is definitely manageable. It's something that we're gonna become real proficient at because that's what we do in sets and reps, is kind of keeping that uh, uh, process going. And I think we would, all, we would all agree that in that instance where we ever had a major emergency, to know exactly where that person is or where, they, where they're supposed to be is the only thing that's gonna set us up for success when that occurs and to be ready for that. Uh, and something that we can do completely in line with what we are doing, just enhancing it. Now, we talked about, uh, we talked about passport tags, we talked about our, I, I even screw this up every time. We talked about accountability tags, passport tags, the Velcro tags on the side of us. Uh, I, I guess there's still a use I guess if we are talking about high-rise operations where a division is keeping track of the people that are working on their division, there's still a piece of that that's available. But all in all, on our day-to-day -day operations on structure fires, our unit uh, accountability tax with the individuals is our, is our accountability system for managing resources. And should be, uh, when we'll, we'll get proficient at when you step off the rig, you step off with that thing in your hand. Questions on this piece? You know, sometimes by the fourth time we teach you, we kind of actually can understand or explain it sometimes well. The first or second times we struggle, but does, does that piece make sense to you? Because this is going to be a big, uh, it's going to be important that we understand that moving forward. Yeah, this, this came up in some of the other sessions, just some concerns about how, you know, how it was working and that kind of thing, but. Um, yeah. You guys are all good? All right. All right, so here's just a diagram of you know a structure fire. We're just gonna kind of play out our first alarm assignment, how it looks, talk about the different pieces, how they all kind of work together. Like this is like the perfect scenario, right? Because it's on paper. Um, and so we'll talk about the different pieces and then we'll move into talking about what a recycle looks like, what a rehab looks like, uh, how do we work that? So we have this little house, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, in a fire, level one staging, and this is our first arriving uh, units. So we have that first arriving officer, correct? They arrive on scene, they evaluate the problem, and they give a report of conditions. It, um, that is a report of conditions that you see on your tactical word sheet right there. Just that building area description, describing the problem, the water supply, 
our initial IEP, what strategy are we in? Whether we're in offensive, defensive, whether we're, you know, there's nothing showing and we're canceling the assignment or we're responding to a second alarm or we're just keeping the assignment or requesting one additional. Uh, we're assuming and naming the uh, incident and then we're just confirming the comp plan. That's it, that's our, that's our report of conditions. And so they complete that, they complete that on channel two. And then now everybody arrives and they level one. Truck one levels one, they get assigned. We do that task, location, objective, um, and they get assigned to roof. So your assignment is to complete a roof report. And then we're gonna get, you need to get back. We have the squad, they show up, level one, engine two, level one, assist with water supply, and then at this point, we're either, again, we're mobile, so we have our assigned units, but we need to complete the next piece, which is uh, complete a 360. And our goal here is just like, we have this snapshot when we first arrive. The snapshot of the initial problem and how are we gonna you know, focus our energies or focus our units on addressing the problem. The 360 is just a confirmation of that. It's like, man, my snapshot was great, or I recognize a completely different problem or a completely different way to, to get around this thing on the Charlie side of the structure or the Delta side of the structure, or there's an exposure that I didn't see initially, or now there's a rescue that I didn't notice, or man, there's a lot of fire in the back, but I can see there's livable space in the back and we're gonna deploy some fan enter search on the Charlie side. Those are all things we're trying to establish. But we're reporting on these things, right? Just the results of the 360, what did we find? Were there any safety concerns that need to be addressed and announced? Is there uh, emergency traffic like uh, power lines down or a priority traffic, like something that changes the strategy? These are things that we need to identify. We confirm the strategy, whether we're continuing offensive or we need to transition to a defensive based upon your second assessment. And then again, just that change to the IP and then the accountability location. You know, engine one, alpha side, that front seat, that's where we're dropping the tags. Can you talk real quick? Yeah. Are you guys gonna get into what you expect from our roof report? Oh yes. Yes. Right. Yeah, so we were uh, we worked with um, a few of the truck captains just kind of trying to identify, just kind of, hey, verify this, you know, what are your thoughts? Um, they already had kind of like a turnkey roof report, and then we took that, kind of disseminated it out to a few people. They came back with just some slight modifications. Hey, this is all great, but I'd like to modify here or add this or think about that. That's it. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. So they complete the 360. We're doing that on the TAC channel. We operate our um, incidents on attack channel. So one of the issues that uh, came up was, hey, we've got this, we've got a two channel system, we've had this two channel system, um, everybody switched over to the attack channel, we're given this 360, which we should be doing right now, right? We should be doing that every single time, but it's something I think that, you know, we've maybe been inconsistent in getting. Um, but if I give it on the TAC channel, then th there's responding units that are not hearing my 360, the results of my 360. And so here's our take on it. We're giving that initial report of conditions. You're in the mobile command position. You are the incident commander. You're deciding based upon your initial impression of the incident, where that first engine company goes, where that truck goes, where that second engine company goes, and maybe what that squad does, or maybe just get the two units. That's your decision. You complete a 360. If you need to adjust with the units that you have on scene, then you make the adjustments. That 360 is not only for the people on scene, but it's mainly for you as a process of just reevaluating what you initially thought was true or not. And then as far as the other units, if they're not hearing that, um, 360, I, I think I would argue that it doesn't make that 
much operational difference. Because you're the IC, you know exactly when it needs to go. And if those units arrive on scene, you're just gonna give them a task location objective to meet the needs of your either changing 360 or your verified 360, and that's it. Um, if there's something critical that needs to be relayed, by all means, we need to relay critical information, stuff that's gonna keep everybody safe. But as far as meeting the objective of an incident, I'd say you'd best, best, uh, it's best taken care of by just giving good direction to meet whatever you found on the 360. Does that make sense? It's nice to hear, right? And it's great to hear. If we can kind of get in the habit of like channel two, tag four, if I can hear that. But if it's me, I'm just assigning units to meet those needs. And if somebody else, if a squad, squad two, arrives on scene from battalion two and battalion one, well then I'm just gonna assign them to meet, meet the uh, you know, change in IEP. Does that make sense? The, and where this stems from is a, a two channel system has its drawbacks, right? That not everybody is gonna be on the same channel during the entire incident. Um, but I think we can mitigate that. Let's think big picture too. You know, I get on scene and I've seen the fire for what? 10 seconds. And I push that push to talk and I give you my report on conditions and it sounds great. But it's based upon 10 seconds of, the, of what I've seen, right? And then I'm gonna do a 360 report. Well, all of us know that a 360 report sounds great, but it's probably more of a modified 200 report, right? Because every one of us has block walls and gates and fences and locks that doesn't allow someone to do a 360. So there's a good chance you're gonna poke your head over the Alpha side or the Bravo side and see what you got. Then you're gonna maybe poke your head over the Delta side and see what you got. And all we're trying to see is if there's something dramatically different than what I already talked about, right? So you're like, oh my goodness, there is fire blowing out of every window out of the back of this house. Well, we probably want to go defensive, right? Or maybe there. So of course we are, that's a dramatic move, right? That's a huge change to your IP. Of course we want to broadcast that. Who's the first people that we want to broadcast that to? The people that are already assigned, right? And then we probably are going to give the assignments to the next rigs that come in that, hey, we have gone defensive now. And when the BC arrives on scene and then we do that transfer of command, guess what we're going to tell them? We're going defensive. And then that BC is then going to broadcast that over the command channel when he gives his update to dispatch that he's uh, assumed command. So there is always the potential of information not being heard if you're on one channel or the other. I think all of us are really savvy captains that when we're responding to an incident, we're on two and we're listening to four, just trying to hear, you know, we hear that attack channel get a little bit stronger and a little bit stronger. Uh, our BCs are right on top that have that ability. We have a scannable radio, but we kind of don't have a scannable radio because we can't listen to two channels. We can scan, but we're, it's not like we're hearing it in both ears. So broadcasting everything on the TAC channel, it makes sense. And there might be circumstances that if there is some piece of information that is so critical that you want every single uh, unit to know, both on the TAC channel that are there and the command channel, then of course broadcast it. If there's some life safety issue that there are power lines flopping everywhere around here and units can play and sleep completely away from this area, by all means, broadcast on a command channel. And that is everything we're doing right now anyhow, right? Right, now it's emergency traffic, right? Emergency, you know, units on whatever incident, emergency traffic, emergency traffic, it's the IC, we have power lines down on the Charlie side. Engine one, you confirm that we have power lines down. That's like outside of the thing. That's, that's what we do right now. So not any different. Not any different. So here we go. So in this little model, it's like, hey, first engine company, they get deployed into the problem. But we need to, our goal is to fill out that 3D model. So now we have this on deck rig position. Maybe that's why, maybe in this scenario, the squad gets assigned to establish a rig cache and control utilities. And they're gonna be that initial two in, two out. Um, fill, in, fill in that role. Um, but that's their position, right? They get that assignment, A, you just establish your crash, control utilities, then you're gonna be on deck. BC arrives, squad two or engine two gets assigned on deck, they're ready to deploy. So right here, let's pause for a moment and just talk about on deck rig. So on deck rig is exactly the same thing. So we have the flexibility to dedicate a rig 
any time the incident is um, complicated. If the complexity is such that we feel that we need a dedicated rig to stand by for the purposes of rescuing firefighters, if it's that dangerous, then we dedicate a rig. But know that if we don't dedicate a rig, you always have a rig team in the on-deck position. First most and their primary responsibility of any unit in the on-deck position is rig. And that, you know, that's the reason why we need to maintain the 3D model. So we've got, we haven't filled it out yet, but at this point we have on-deck position, they're either a dedicated rig or they're in that on-deck ready to perform the position of a uh, rapid intervention crew. And Scott, just because I know this is something that's been talked, it's been a point of discussion. There's by no means are we saying that we don't need Rick. There's by no means are we saying that Rick is important or that uh, an, an on-deck on crew, it will always be a Rick team. We understand that that isn't the case. We're never gonna jeopardize firefighter safety. And if the strategic commander or any commander feels that we need to have a dedicated Rick team, by all means, you can have a dedicated Rick team. But we also know what every incident has done, right? It starts here, it does this, and then it does this, right? So after that period of where it's escalated, that we are concerned. We've had fire burning in this structure for 10 minutes. We know that fire loading is high. We know that structural integrity is uh, potentially compromised. We have individuals inside there. Okay, let's have a dedicated rig team. That crew is dedicated rig. That is their assignment. They are a unit identifier. They are engine three. What's their assignment? Rick operations. They will always be engine three. Their assignment, their tactical objective is rig operations. They're assigned rig. All right, now things start to de-escalate. All right, fire's been knocked down, fire is defensive, whatever it has, then we do not feel that we need to have a dedicated rig team anymore. We just take that their assignment, it's a status change, and they now move into the on-deck position, or any unit that's in on-deck. They have a rig cache located next to them. At any given moment in that incident, if there were to be an emergency, that crew's new uh, uh, task, their tactical objective will be RIC operations. So we always have RIC. We are either always going to have a dedicated RIC team or we're going to have a RIC, uh, the on deck team that could rapidly become the assignment, which has its benefits, right? One is if you're assigned RIC and you never get any work done and then the fire de escalates and you got a crew that's just standing around that hasn't really done anything, they can get into the mix. Also, late stages. When we cut, when we shut down Rick, we can still get hurt on a fire, right? You know, there's there's injuries that occur, people fall through uh, floors, there can be an injury during overhaul, and then we have a Rick team always available. Dedicated Rick, of course, if we need it, always have a Rick team. So does that? Did we? If we had any issues, I hope that clarifies the Rick team operations. Completely compliant. We will always have a Rick team. We can have a dedicated rig team if need be, but if not, every crew that's on deck should understand it. Remember, this is that worst case scenario. When you're in the front yard and on deck, the worst case scenario is that we need you to become the rig team right away, correct? That's it, that's that word the next broadcast is made in. Or you might be, hey, you're gonna go pull some more ceiling in the kitchen, but you're always available. And that's what we mean is that you're in that state of readiness knowing that your next assignment might be Rick or it could be any other function on that fire. Yeah, the people who invented Rick have no desire to get rid of Rick. In fact, they just feel like the system, like the total system, it, that it's not just the responsibility of one crew on the front lawn. That it's, yes, we have that one crew on the front lawn ready to, to respond in, but it's a total system that should respond rapidly to a, a down firefighter. And that's the way they kind of look at it. Like that rig team is one piece, but it's a global system that allows, you know, the commander to respond to a problem really quickly. And we know what Scott's mentioning there, that globally we know that 95% of the rig activations and the main day activations glo uh, nationally have been solved either by the individual themselves, they self rescued the crew of the individual or an adjacent individual. Only 5%, and this is that Abbott study is pretty much looked at every Mayday wherever uh, rescued by a Rick team. Not saying that we don't need it. We're not saying that because of that statistic, we will always have that Rick team, but we know the likelihood of someone in this room getting disoriented, 
It's going to be like, hey, Miguel, I'm right here. Let's get back to work. It's going to be like, Miguel was here a second ago, and then he went through the floor. I know exactly where he's out. He's right there. Let's rescue him. Or it's going to be that other line, you know, truck two's on the roof. Someone calls through. We're interior. There's Tony. Hey, man, get back to work. Get back up there. And I know I'm kind of downplaying that, but that's how the likelihood the statistics show. And so we will always have Rick. We will always use Rick. And we'll do everything we can to have everybody safe and have a team ready at any given time. The beauty of this, from the very first minute of the fire until that Rick cash gets picked up on the very last, we will have Rick in place. And that's a little, not that it's a little bit better, that's the best we can do, right? Yeah, and just the, my last point on this, and this is, the, this is the number one reason why this is a communication and accountability system. So when that problem does occur, you've got your crew together, the IC knows exactly where everybody is, and if there's somebody who does a mayday, they know exactly who's in there, in that area, what the unit is, who the adjacent unit is, and they can quickly kind of, you know, attack the fire. That's it. All right, so, and then we got engine three on scene. That's our 3D model, right? We've got a, a unit into level one staging. We have crews in the on deck position, and then we have crews deployed to the ideal age. We've got the roof assessment, which uh, Brian was talking about, so let's just take a, a minute to review that. If you look down at your tactical worksheet, it's also there, kind of next to the, uh, truck company assignment or truck truck unit uh, little category on the front uh, front part so this is mainly uh, from their website or what they're suggesting and we've modified a little bit to kind of meet our needs and what we need here in the city of Riverside so first one is just that type you get assigned to the roof need you to do a roof assessment you know, see if there's any extension, whatever it is, depending on the incident. Maybe it's just we need to figure out the ventilation profile. Maybe there's no need to go vertically, ven vertically ventilate at all. Maybe we need to check for extension, but at the minimum, the first assignment is roof assignment. I need you to, just like the first arriving would come in, do an assessment, and then do a transfer command with the battalion chief. Hey, this is what I got, this is what we've done. Here you go, this is the exact same thing. Uh, truck company gets signed to the roof and they evaluate the type, the type of roof it is, the conditions, fire and smoke conditions. And that those conditions just, you know, is it safe on top or is it safe underneath? Can we stand on it? Is it safe for the people inside to be under the roof? Uh, the fire and smoke conditions, the firewalls, if, if we're on that type of structure, right? Strip mall, multifamily dwellings, etc. those type of structures. On the roof loads, do we have just a ton of ACs? Is the entire roof on this small commercial structure just giant AC unit and HVAC systems? That's a heavy load. Is it a standard load? Is it a medium load? What are the conditions in the attic? Is there any extension? Is there fire? No fire. What's the layout of the building if it's unusual or unique? And then what are the actions that we need to take? A, no fire involvement. It looks like there's light smoke flat stable roof, we're going to reevaluate our ventilation profile and exit the roof. That, that's it. Or we have that conversation with the IC and hey, I've got information from the interior crew, crew that they've got heavy smoke and heat, they need vertical, vertical ventilation. Copy, vertical, vertically ventilated. And um, you know, this piece it's like, you know, when we did the online portion, because Phoenix is just, they just, they moved away from it, right? They don't do vertical ventilation. When I went and did the, um, and same thing with Brian, when, when we went and did the train the trainer, it's just us and a bunch of other fire departments from around the country. You know, two people like us, or chiefs, or just captains, or officers, you know, within their respective fire department. And guess what they do? They do exactly what we do. And blue card, you know, it's a system, right? And they're selling this system to a nation. And around the nation, there are different departments that do different things, and not everybody does the same thing. And so they fully recognize that different departments are gonna have different policies, they're gonna have different tactics, and um, vertically ventilate, they, Phoenix doesn't vertically ventilate, Blue Card has no problem with it. If you're the department and you do that, no problem. Um, 
Anything to add to that, the last piece, or no? No, just remember uh, that uh, ultimate blessing to ventilate comes from the battalion chief. You're assigned a roof report, you get the roof report, that battalion chief or that strategic command, based upon the, the can report from the interior crews, your can report gives you the blessing, yes or no. Which is what we're doing right now. And, exactly, go ahead. So just a question real quick, just so I really understand. So the roof report will be given, if assigned the roof division, the roof report will be given. Yeah. Now let, let me let me just because you work you're working on the roof division. So let's not get this is a this is these, these words are kind of similar and they get confused. You are either to divine to assign a division supervisor role or you work on a division. Those are two different things. You're going to work on a division so you're working on the roof division. You are truck one working on the roof division. That doesn't mean that you've been assigned roof division. You're working on. It. Now we have a commercial fire where we have all of our truck companies, I could assign a roof group supervisor who would then coordinate all of the truck companies that are working on the roof. So you've been assigned roof, and your assignment was to give me a roof report. You have one assignment, and I'm not, I'm, don't make me sound bad if I break this slow down, but yeah. this is how easy it is. You're given one assignment, your assignment was to give a roof report. So you go there and understand that whole roof report right there is not just for the ventilation profile, but it, it tells the IC a lot, right? Hey, do I have working fire? Do I have no fire? Do I have a working attic fire? This is going to adjust their idea of what I have. So you're going to go up there and you're going to give a roof report. Your assignment's complete. Now you're waiting for your next assignment. Based upon your roof report, he's going to say vent or not vent. Because your, your suggestion is that we can cut on this roof. Now, Brian, we, we talked about this before. We have the spectrum of incidents, right? These fires we shouldn't be venting on. These fires we shouldn't be venting on, and all the stuff in the middle we should be. So this fire way over here, this is the interior crews tell me they have nothing. You're telling me that you have a nice sound roof. Give me a second, hold off, stand by for your assignment, and let me figure out what we got in the interior. Because your roof looks perfect, correct? You're like, this thing is solid, nothing, it is ready to be cut. Interior is like, hey, we can't find the fire. Stand by. You gave me your roof report. Stand by for your next assignment. On the other end, hey, this fire and this roof is totally involved. Fire through the roof. Guess what? You don't need to go on that one. Get off. All the other ones in the middle is when we're going to vent. And the reality is, if interior crews are saying, hey, I got heat and smoke, and I'm seeing that from the street, and then you get on the roof and you tell me get a good roof, guess what every IC is going to tell you to do? It's to cut. It's those two extremes, the one that is unsafe and the one that is not necessary, where you're going to be told not to. And that comes from the IC, and he's going to, that's where the coordination comes in, right? Because you're now hearing the roof report as the interior crew. Interior, you're also hearing what they have, and that's where that coordinated piece comes together and we go to work. All right, so we've kind of, that first point, we kind of beat that up. Uh, just that on deck position. It's used for rig, we can dedicate as needed, um, but the on deck is primar primarily for rig. And when you're in that position, that's what you're mainly doing, or be Um And then that 3D model, again, we've kind of said this multiple times, is that ensures that we have that tactical reserve ready to fill the void if we do deploy those on deck positions into the IDLH or to an additional problem or an area that we need to take care of, then we just move a unit from level one you know, to that on deck position. But we need a tactical reserve. If, we're if we only have one unit at level one and we deploy that on deck position and we move that level one position into the on deck, we have a void in level one. So if the situation is expanding or the incident is expanding, then it's just on us to go ahead and order an additional or two units in order to have that tactical reserve. And um, we always want to maintain that 3D model and just have the availability. If, if it gets it de-escalates and there's no need, just like we always do, we don't cancel. We don't need, we don't need them anymore. But uh, during the throes of the incident, we need that 3D model. 
Um, so that, again, just a reiteration, we have to transmit that report of conditions. Uh, when we give orders, there's that task, location, objective for everyone. You do that mobile command, that second unit, you're giving your task, location, objective, what you're doing. Oh, you know, you're assigned to fire control or fire attack, primary search, alpha side or attack a fire on the Bravo side, um, you should, whatever, what's your objective? That, you know, just those tactical priorities. Fire control, primary search. Um, and then in the hazard zone, the last point there is just this, because this is a communication model, it's on the responsibility of all the um, company officers, whether you're a chief officer, whether you're a company officer, is just to maintain that radio discipline. We have several different types of communication, and they're all done with a CAN report. You know, we have the um, status change, which we've talked about, right? That's that I need to report my movement. Again, back to the accountability piece. I am inside, we're low on air, we need to recycle. I have a status change, we need to recycle. Got it. We need to recycle. Go ahead and recycle and then back to on deck. Okay, we move another pe person in. If we're on the first floor, I have a status change. First floor, second floor, to check for extension. Or no problem, you know, nothing on the first floor, we'll move to the second floor. That's a status change. I was assigned to the first floor, and now my status change is to Division 2, or whatever it is, Division 3, Division 4. Um, it's just that, that piece, where you are. So the, the BC, that strategic command, can keep track of where everybody is at all times. Um, the other piece is just our priority traffic, right? We have priority traffic, emergency traffic, mayday traffic, we have our status change, and our tactical priorities achieved. Just that we have knocked down to the fire, the fire is in control, we have lost stop, we have all clears. Those are our tactical priorities. Um, and that's our communication. And when we achieve those, I see engine one got knocked down to the fire, um, applying water, good effect, we have no needs. Done, that's my camp. Or if I have priority traffic, priority traffic is, again, back to one of those first two sessions that we had. Priority traffic is that traffic uh, where there's, we notice something that changes our IAP. I have priority traffic, um, we have an attic in the, a fire in the attic. We now have fire in the attic. That would be a change, right? What would be another change? Um, fire through the roof. Fire through the roof. If we thought we had room and contents and all of a sudden we have an attic fire, does that change the complexity of the if we had fire that's uh, isolated to the first floor and now it's well established to the second floor, is that a change in tactics? So that is priority traffic. I think that's a little bit of a difference for us because we have that kind of gray area. What, what was the difference between priority and what was the difference between emergency? Now, priority traffic is anything that's gonna change the IAP. Anything that's gonna change the action plan, that's priority traffic. If it can hurt someone, it's emergency traffic. And if, if you're lost or if you're hurt, it's Mayday traffic. Mayday is never gonna change, just that emergency and, and understand, and I think we're all smart enough, if, there, if I see something that I think can hurt me or anybody else on the fire ground, that's emergency traffic all day. Yeah, power lines down, emergency traffic. And a partial collapse of the, the structure on the Charlie side, emergency traffic. Um, so anyway, that's the, that radio discipline. We're not, you know, we don't need to do, a story, it's just that short term sticking, uh, sticking to that communication model and that's what we're talking. We don't need to go on and on about this or that. We've got it done or we need help. Give a CAM report for everything. So let's, let's stop here for a moment. Let's just take 10 minutes and then we'll come back, kind of reiterate the 3D model. Let's take a break for a few minutes. All right, fellas, let's get back going again. All right, so here we got is the, the three deep deployment model. The, I, think we've, uh, I think we all understand the importance of the three deep deployment model and how we build out the three deep deployment model. Now, one of the things that we need to understand with the three deep deployment model is that 
we understand that at some point we, we're not going to have stuff in staging anymore, right? Because they are all going to be on deck. So we're not going to just leave rigs in staging sitting until the end. We can have multiple units on deck. I think there was a question asked before that <coughs> deck isn't a single circle that you can only, it only fits one crew. We can have multiple crews on deck. And, uh, but we'll have that. Now one of the beauties of this system is that it has the ability to expand and contract and we can build our system based upon it. So what that means is as an incident commander, if you have no one in staging and your incident is continuing to develop, what do you need to do? Order additional resources, right? Your indicator that you, there's more work than there is resources is that I don't have anybody level one. On the other hand, if I am starting to de-escalate and I see that I have a lot of resources, level one or level two, that I don't have work for, what do we do with those resources? Then we start releasing them. So you see how that level one staging, those uh, level two staging, that on deck position, and then the individuals that are working inside that hazard zone. Now, there, there's a couple other circles that you see in there with an arrow. These are these other task-driven uh, uh, positions. One of those is a division uh, supervisor and the other is a safety officer. So what that's saying is that if you are assigned a division as a division supervisor, that your role is that you are going to run that division. You see how, just like we would, we would do this on most of our incidents, you are observing what the operations are and you're able to see the big picture, that you're running that. Now, we, have, we understand that this entire blue card system revolves around two entities, the strategic command and the, and the mobile command officers, and then all of us. If we are going to be given a division assignment, if an IC gives a division assignment where you are going to be run a division group supervisor, it is true ICS. That not only are you given that, but you're also given the accountability for the crews that are on your division, you're given the resource management for the resources that are on your division, and the tactical assignments of the resources that are on your division. I always think of it like every wildland fire we've been to, right? We all work for a division, that division does what? Keep track of all the resources, request more resources if it needs to, and gives you your tactical assignments. And that's what our divisions are, no different, because this is just true ICS. Also though, what does the strategic command have to do at the same time? Give it up, give it up. They delegate that responsibility, and why are they giving it up? Why would they delegate it in the first place? Expand control. Expand control, exactly. They, we only need to create divisions when they are necessary. And if they are necessary, then I give up that because the burden on me was difficult. That I had too many resources to manage, I give up that one, but when I give it up, I'm giving up the accountability of it, I'm giving up the resource management of it, and the tactical assignment. Now, the IC obviously is gonna come up with the overall strategies, right? The incident priorities. But you as the division level, you come up with the tactics how you're going to reach those. And this slide here is just that review of that order model which we talked about before. Just that radio discipline as far as how we talk when you're given an order, when you receive an order, how do I communicate with somebody else on the fire ground? How do I communicate with that strategic IC? How does the strategic, uh, strategic IC communicate with the mobile command or one of the other uh, officers? And this is the model. The sender contacts the receiver. Um, battalion one, engine one. Receiver states readiness. Engine one, battalion one, I'm ready. Go ahead. Sender transmits the message. You briefly restate the message to confirm its understanding and then and then you make any corrections or misunderstanding upon the receiver, right? So it's no longer just the, hey, I got my assignment, copy. There's no just, I copy. It's, I receive an order, your assignment is um, fire attack, primary search, alpha side, I copy. My assignment is fire attack, primary search, Alpha side, that's correct, or whatever. And if I say, oh, my assignment is fire attack primary search Bravo side, and say, 
correction, no, that's not correct. Your assignment was fire attack, primary search, alpha site. Okay, copy, alpha site. And so it's just that confirmation of going back and forth, ver verifying what has been said and that what has been said is accurate. And it's both ways, right? It's the receiver confirming that what they hear is correct and then it jives with the, what, uh, what is going on and then the opposite way. And then just to meet in the middle. And so that's that at the heart of this thing, this communication model to make sure that accountability is good, it reduces traffic, it prevents deployment mistakes, and then also just freelancing, right? No longer the copy, we need to verify what's been said and then re-verify it. Clinky, you have, uh, you have Woods, right? He's been on eight, two, months. two months, right? This is exactly what you're teaching Woods to do, right? When I give you an order, you repeat the order, we confirm that you understand what I say, that I, I think every one of us, when we went to our basic fire academy, what did they teach us? This. Repeat we teach every one of our rookies what? This. It just can, needs, it just continues. You know why we do it? Because it works, right? Because it, it, it reduces mistakes, it ensures that both parties are on the same page. And this is gonna be a part, especially on sets and reps, where we're gonna really start utilizing this on everything. Every, uh, every uh, order that's given by the IC, we're gonna use this in our communication model. Much like we have always done and that we've been teaching from day one on this. Okay, so first point here is just um, in the ideal age, we kind of hit on this, but as far as our designator, our designator is gonna be our unit number, whatever that is, engine one, engine two, truck one, truck three, squad one, engine five, that's our name. We're not gonna be interior, we're not gonna be fire attack. Fire attack would be our assignment or our tactical objective. It's not our designator. Our designator is gonna be our unit. And um, that's, you know, and then we're gonna be assigned to a geographical location. And then just responsible for completing those tactical priorities, that's it. So no longer it's, you know, this whole thing is just kind of creating some uniformity. And the, the goal here is that when you work overtime, you go to this battalion or that battalion, you know, it's an easy thing. You're always, you start the day off as your unit, whatever it is, engine eight. Your engine eight throughout the day, all night, and then on your next shift. And uh, it's, and it's good, right? Because I can look around the, the classroom right now and probably name the units that everybody's on. And so it goes along with that. But then it also, it just takes out that piece of naming something to an area that doesn't make sense. I know exactly what the units are. It's consistent across the board within our ICS. It's what we do on wildland fires. It's what we do on high rise fires. You're either a division, and then you have engine one, engine two, engine three in your division. But while you're performing work, you are engine one, engine two, engine three. That's it. Um, same thing with RIC operations. Your function is going to be RIC, the rescuing of a firefighter or a downed subject. But your unit is engine one. That's what you're going to be called. Engine one, you're performing RIC functions. I need you to establish a RIC cache. Or, hey, I need you to deploy to the Charlie Center structure for rescue of a downed firefighter. You're engine one. And then I just move that piece, engine one, and then um, really easy for the tracking and accountability. Um, any questions on that? I know that's something that um, is a change for us. You know, in the past, we've called ourselves interior or fire attack. And, you know, I kind of feel like sometimes there's a little confusion as to you can see the unit and you say, you look around, you're like, oh, you're on engine one. I know you're on engine four, but uh, wait, who's, who's fire attack? Who's interior? And what are your responsibilities? This way, it's engine one. I have two responsibilities, fire attack, primary search, and I'll always be engine one. Plus, I think it simplifies. Like, when we assign someone fire attack or interior, what are we assigning them? Do they run it? Are they assigned that location? Yeah. It's a task, right? But we're assigning a task to a geographical location. And you can see where sometimes those don't mesh. Sometimes we assign interior, and we want you to give you all the assignment. Other times, you're just going to that location. Here, this should be real clear, right? Because you are 
truck two, you are engine three, you are engine 12. That is what you are, and we are then going to tell you what your tactical objective is going to be. I need you to do a primary search. I need you to do loss control. I need you to uh, do ventilation. I need you to do brick operations. I need you to secure the utilities. When we're given an order, it should also be very objective, right? Because you know what your I need to secure utilities. I know what I was told. I secure utilities, and I know the end state. I know what is done, and then that is that status change, right? Or more of a of an assignment completion. I've completed my assignment. What's my next? So the next point here is just to kind of remain consistent, um, and not just to do it, but you know it, it's consistent, right? If um, you know we reach our span of control on an incident, as far as units, we assign a division, and so the same rules apply to the IDLH, and, and that's what we're doing, right? That IC has that bigger picture. As soon as the third unit has been assigned to an IDLH or a roundabout, you know every Every situation is going to be different, but as a general rule, or maybe a trigger point, if you've assigned three units into the ideal age, that's the point to assign a division. Uh, and we've already kind of talked on, uh, talk, talked on this. Captain Gazette has uh, mentioned a couple times. If you get assigned that division position, you are fully responsible for all the tactical objectives being achieved within that division. You're responsible for requesting additional resources when you're assigned. You're responsible for the accountability and tracking. If it's so complex that you need a safety officer additional help, then we request that help. But it is a true division position. It's, um, I know we kind of mentioned this in maybe in other classes, and I don't know if I've said it here, but I kind of feel like in the past that we've um, just kind of been in two different places at one time. We're asked to complete these tactical objectives like we do now, but then we're given the position of interior, which I would almost kind of loosely or formally define as a division. It's like, I'm gonna assign you to attack this fire, but I'm gonna give you the name of interior, which almost says, well, you not only have attack and fire, but primary surge, and now I want you to coordinate loss control, and then, you know, whatever, I need you to coordinate, with the I need you to do all this stuff. Um, this kind of moves away from that. If there's three units assigned, assign a division. If you need to be division, separate yourself. You know, if you've got your crew, and you've got that engineer, assign them, or if you need help to take over, then assign that. I need X, Y, Z to assume the responsibility of the fire control and primary search. I'm now division, get a can. You step out, assume that division spot. Engine one, give me a can. Engine two, give me a can. Okay, I'm now a division. You go around, check in with everybody, and now you've got all those responsibilities. And, and we always think of this on the front side of the incident, right? You know what we're really good at? The front side of the incident. We put fires out really good, right? Half the time the confusion comes on what? Yeah, the back side of the incident. So now, understand that we, anytime we have people stacked on top of one another, is a great time to have a division. Uh, they use the rule of thumb of, what did it say here, uh, when a third unit. So we have, we have knocked out on the fire, and now we have significant overhaul. So I'm gonna have five units do an overhaul. What we don't want is five units, three of them working, two of them not working. The IC, can they manage that from where they're at? Probably not. So a perfect opportunity to assign a division, whether it's division alpha, division one, what's that individual we're then gonna do? Manage the workload of those additional units to perform the one task which then they could say, hey, do I have enough resources? Do I have my rotation? I have that one individual. So we always think of all these assignments on the front side, like the aggressive fire attack side, but we understand that that's only a few minutes of the fire. This can work out the entire time. And I think with, especially that example, because we've all been on that fire where one person's working, another person's not working, one company's over here, seems like one crew has all the workload, you assign a division during that period of time, they manage that, they, ro they do rotations, and that frees up that complexity. So we have all those infinite abilities to be to assigning a division group suit project. And last two points is kind of almost like stating the obvious. The IC must constantly evaluate and adjust the incident strategy in the IAP. That's just that a reminder of 
of that constant evaluation, going back to those critical five round factors, adjusting your strategy, or reevaluating your strategy, readjusting your IEP or continuing it if need be, doing those tactical objectives, and then that constant process of just checking to see if what you're doing is actually working. Um, and the last point, if needed, just support the IC with the command team. Now, they make it sound so easy, right? This is blue car, they come from Phoenix. You know, when they employ a command team, it's like in this giant command vehicle with this beautiful glass and this long table, and you've got all these commanders with headsets on, talking on radios, five of them all in a row, just filling out tactical worksheets. But here in Riverside, we don't have a command feel like that. And we just don't have all the chief officers that can just at a moment's notice just flood a big incident. It takes a little bit of time. Um, and it's a little bit more challenging for us because of the size of our department. But we do a good job meeting the need. And I think that just kind of like the, the obvious thing here is when an incident expands, we just need to, whatever form that takes, whether it's pulling from company officers from the scene, or grabbing a training captain, or some of our chief officers, officers responding from their office or from home, that's the situation that we have. And that's what they're talking about, is just augmenting that command staff in order to meet the needs of a, a growing incident. Yeah, that, that Phoenix model is like too extreme, right? We, I, I've never seen any department that has anything close to that. We have big time LA cities, LA counties, they don't have that model. What we have is we, if, if at any time, the complexity of it is exceeding your ability, and that's not a, to say your ability can't, we always should augment that. Whether that is by assigning division group supervisors to take your workload away, to having a support staff, a, a scribe next to you, uh, ordering safety officers, ordering additional individuals, that, that is our command team. And I think we would all agree that one BC running five alarms is not safe. Now we're never gonna have the Phoenix vehicle, which I see a lot of it in their videos, so I don't know if we've ever, how, how likely that thing ever got brought out either, but uh, we need to support the team, and we have the ability to support that team, and we're doing much better, right? You know, with our second alarm BC coverage, uh, with, uh, you know, you know, Scott and I, and the uh, significant incident notification, and then that even trickles down to you or any of us that if you could be pulled away. So you know how we talked about that crews are intended to be kept together? Well, don't think that that is like that you're locked and handcuffed together. We would rather you all be working together if possible and not being spread apart into four different locations. That might mean that, hey, I need Miguel to be my accountability officer next to me. And then the remainder of the crew stays together. That's what we need to do as much as possible. But understand that it's not in concrete that crews need to be, we just need to maintain that integrity as much as possible. And to be flexible. Okay, so we're gonna, as I said before, we're gonna go through this kind of like this uh, recycle. What does that look like? What does that mean? We've kind of talked to all the, all the, about all the pieces. And at this point, it should make, uh, uh, it should make sense. Same thing with the rehab. So the, in this scenario, we've got our recycle. We've got truck one on the roof, engine one, trying to take care of that problem. We've got engine two, squad two on deck, performing those rig functions or being ready to deploy. We've got the battalion chief, transfer of command with the battalion chief. They're now in that IC number two position. And we've got units in level one, level two staging. So we've got a lot of units. We've got that 3D model already. And then now we've kind of maybe mitigated the, um, the initial incident and we're ready to recycle. And so that's just that status change. You know, IC, engine one, out of air, we need to recycle. We've got a status change, we need to recycle. I copy, you have status change, you're ready to recycle. Um, recycle and then go back to deck. So they recycle. IC deploys units to the problem area. BC makes sure that they are time tracking and keeping record of how long and who's where and what they're doing. And then moves units right into the deck, into the on deck position. 
So we always have that on deck position filled. We have that quick response from the on deck into the IDLH, and we give that people give those uh, those people coming from out of the IDLH that opportunity to, to air up, water up, and then get back to on deck if needed. So you notice just like on recycled, kind of a standard is, is maybe twice through. Obviously that may need to be adjusted best based upon the weather. If it's super hot or just the conditions, or maybe we've had quite a few incidents, maybe we only recycle once and then we go back to rehab, we rehab. Or maybe it's just a cold day and it's just not an issue. Um, that's gonna be on the, the company officer, right? Kind of evaluating their crew, keeping everybody together, uh, making sure that we're all fit, not hurt, ready to work, and then taking the breaks as we need. And so that is recycle. And so this is rehab. You know, in this whole scenario, we've got something real similar. We've got somebody in the recycle position um, getting ready to complete there and go on deck. And we've got crews, engine one, squad two, squad one, who maybe recycled a couple times. It's like, okay, you recycled, need you to go ahead and rehab. That's an assignment. So they go to rehab, real orderly, engine two from on deck into the ideal age, continue the work that engine one and squad uh, two or squad one was performing. They have that kind of like face-to-face -face pass off. Hey, what were you guys doing? You're coming out, I'm going in. Where were you working? What's your problem? Oh, I got this, need to pull air, you know, pull ceiling over here. You know, we're looking good in there. Okay, sounds good. Engine three is done with recycle, they're ready to go on deck. And we still have our tactical reserve as far as engine four, engine five. If that suffices, no need to have any more units, yep, let's go ahead and get rid of engine five. If the thing is de-escalating and there's no need, we can maintain our, our units with what we got, right? No problem. But that's kind of like that recycle, rehab uh, process, maintaining that 3D model. Did, did you have anything to add to that or? No, just uh, obviously rehab is IC dependent, correct? Uh, August 110 out, two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, rehab might be 30 minutes. Uh, recycle is IC dependent as well. Uh, it might be a one cylinder change uh, and then back to work and then into rehab. It might be no cylinder changes that we're putting everybody into rehab. Rehab might be formal. Man, it might be, you know, I need to get the squad there to be taking vitals or something, or it's, and then remember that the IC is the uh, timekeeper. And when you say, hey, I need to re rehab, okay, rehab 30 minutes and then back to deck. Okay, 20 minutes and back to deck. Uh, from recycle, you can either, if you need to recycle, hey, recycle back to your position. You know, say you were on the roof and there was some work up there, truck one, hey, recycle and then back to the roof or recycle back to deck. Okay, so we always know that once we recycle where we're going to end up next. Or even recycle to release. You know, we always, we always kind of think of the incident still going, but remember that's always. Uh, or recycle to uh, decon, uh, or recycle to release. So I another question real quick. I don't know if this is by coincidence or and just past conversations I've had with the blue parts. So accountability is a big thing. What do we do with the squad because they don't have a supervisor? Yeah. And then I saw kind of your uh, recycle and rehab scenarios here. The squad was attached to an engine. Is that something that we're trying to go to, or is that just coincidence? You know, uh, it's up to our VCs what they want to do with the with the squad. You know, I think there's always the argument that they don't have a captain that's working with them, and putting them into the ideal age is probably without a captain might not be the best working. Model. Historically, that's what we've done. Um, I think historically also that we had some very skilled firefighters on the squad, and maybe the people that are on the squad today might not have the experience to be acting independently. So one on the IC, I think that is the first indicator is who I have on the squad that day. And the second, uh, would it, it maybe it is prudent to marry them up with the, with the crew. We know that right off the bat, the first two engines are already short, short staffed, right? Just because they have either they're a two engine crew or a three engine crew based upon their one operator out there. Uh, 
they can be that variable that I can augment any of my other rigs that need staffing. Um, what, what would Blue Card say? You know, that's what everybody says. What would, what would Phoenix say? Phoenix said, would tell us and they would laugh like, hey, and this is my question. Because I'm like, hey, what should we do with squats? What would your be opinion to do with a squat? We have a squat, and you know what their answer was? They should run medical <laughs> They should be running medical And you're like, well, how about when they get fire experience? Well, then they should go to an engine and they'll get fire experience. Uh, because they don't, they don't like the fact that they're non-supervised, that there's not a red helmet working with them. And, and Brian and I agree. I think that uh, you know, historically we've done with some very skilled firefighters and they've been successful. Uh, but I think that is an, uh, one of our BC's uh, decision of what to do with them. I don't think that we should tie our hands. Honestly, I feel like, and, and this isn't my role by any means, yeah, but, I know, I mean, but a, squad, a squad to the IREC responsibilities is a great first job for them to establish a free cash, to, uh, to capture utilities, and then get married up with the position. Would be a, a great you, for a job for them. Um, you know, Blue Card also doesn't like, or the fact, and when I say Blue Card doesn't like, statistically, they don't like people doing searches without a hose line. They say if there's a way to get killed on a fire, it's to do a search without a hose line. And I understand that there's probably some areas in this country where that is a dangerous, dangerous job. You know, we all see these big warehouses, these multiple stories back east and stuff where you can see where they put people. For the most part, what do we do? If we send a squad in without a hose line, where is the hose line? It's either in front of them, it's on to the right of them. The, 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 the hose line is going to the fire and the squad is searching the adjacent rooms behind them. Would you say that they're still under the protection of the hose line? Yeah. Are we in some warehouse in New York where we're doing unmanned lines? So I think it's dynamic. I wouldn't say that we always want to marry the squads with an engine company. Because there might be. But I think if we have individuals working deep in the IDO, they should be prudent to, to attach them to someone. Our goal to make sure that there's some supervision. Somewhere. Yeah, I think always, okay. always. Uh, now understand, outside of the outside of the hot zone, there's great work for them, right? There is rehab, there is medical. Those are great. If we're going to marry them with someone, if we're going to put them in the hot zone, I think it, it, it's prudent to marry them with a red helmet. And chief, I agree. Good okay. or not good, but I, I totally agree. I mean, same thing that we're doing now. Um, the spots are going to continue, obviously, going to structure fires, so this is being cognizant of anywhere, but I agree with what kind of is devastated. Is that pretty clear to you, or? Yeah, no, it's clear. Yeah. You know, the one thing that, when, when we were do, reviewing all this, one of the things we never wanted to happen is to tie our hands. And you can kind of see, we, we took most of this PowerPoint right from Blue Card. And you know what Blue Card's really good at in the Brunicinis is that you have to and that you must, and that there's only one way of doing things. And we know that that doesn't work here, right? So to say that a, a squad always has to be married with the, with the crew, with the captain, I feel that that's something that we don't want to handcuff ourselves or anything. We know that stuff is so dynamic, but I think we all agree. And Brian, I know that like, I remember when you were on the squad, and when a lot of you were on the squad, man, they were senior squad teams. And now I look at our squads nowadays, and what's the combined experience on that squad right now? Right off the of probation. Yeah, you have one year and one year and one day, and that's our squad team. And uh, you know, as much as a IC needs to be aware of the fire conditions and of uh, assignments, the the crews that are rolling in are just as important, and making sure that ultimately everybody's safe and everybody is supervised. Yeah. So that's rehab. Um, and if, if those crews are going to continue to work, that's that 20 minutes period of time. Again, not a hard and fast rule or an absolute, depending on the conditions, you know, it may be less or maybe even more. You've just got to be able to be flexible, but the, maybe the plan A is 20 minutes. And then they, uh, after that, yeah, if they're rehab and they're ready to get to work, they're either going to decon and then getting released, or they're getting filtered back into the work cycle. Based upon the need. Did you want to take this round? Sure, sure. I mean, you know, this is another, uh, I think, beauty of blue card uh, or of our system is zone identifications. 
Now, this is once again, we didn't create this. This isn't a blue card thing. This is straight out of Firescope right here. Is that, and this is actually even built upon in NIOSH that we identify zones within our instance. So what we are gonna want is, is that we identify these three different zones, a hot zone, a warm zone, and a cold zone. Much of this terminology is nothing new to us, right? So the hot zone is where we need to be on air. That's that true ideal H. Where on our given fires are we, where's the, where is the hot zone gonna be? Inside the house. So when you cross the threshold, you're going into the hot zone, right? Not a big change. Outside of the hot zone is the warm zone. The warm zone is where the individual has the SCD on their back and they're ready to go on air at a moment's notice. Who would we find in the warm zone? On deck, the rig team, of course, that's where they are. Everything outside of that is the cold zone. The cold zone is where people do not need to wear PPE. So, where, what would we find in the cold zone? Strategic command. The level one and level two staging areas. Rehab. Recycle could be, kind of be one of those iffy ones, right? Because we might have like a cache of SCDA bottles where you get there, you throw your bottle, you know, where we, but it's probably right there on the borderline, right? I like that one. The medical rehab, that's all in that green zone, in the cool zone. Now, the only, the person who determines the zone is the IC. The IC is responsible for establishing the zones and they're the ones that can upgrade it or downgrade it. All right. I think this should probably put a thought into your head. We have this mystical moment on each incident where we go from being an ideal H to not an ideal H, right? I know we all chuckle, but it's because we all know that occurs. We have this mystical moment. When does that moment occur? I often feel it occurs when the first person takes their SCBA off and then people follow. Um, who is the ultimate, uh, who's ultimately responsible for the safety of everybody on the incident? The incident commander. So who's the individual who determines when the hot zone is no longer the hot zone? The strategic command. The IC, the strategic command. So understand that that is going to be a burden on our VCs, but they are also ultimately responsible for the safety of all of us. I think for us in these seats, it makes our life easy. If I'm in the hot zone, what am I doing? I'm breathing air. Until someone tells me I'm not in the hot zone, what am I doing? I'm breathing air. If I'm not in the hot zone, I'm in the warm zone, I have an SCBA in my pack. Should we have just people wandering around the fire ground without personal protective gear on? No. Should it, should it be that if you are in the cold zone, that that's where the IC should be, that's where the rehab should be, that's where, uh, that's where medical should be. So that will help us play out and that's established and downgraded by the IC. We got another little foe, the next slide just shows some very basic concepts, everything we talked about. We got the hot zone, we can see the on deck crew, the rig crew, everything we talked about. Like Brian just mentioned, all the, the units in level one and level two staging are in that green zone. Rehab's in the green zone. Medical's in the green zone. Remember again, I, uh, this is kind of that blue card ICS. We know where you're at at all times. We can have groups all day long in the green zone, right? All day long because we, we don't need to be concerned exactly where someone is located in the green zone, in the cool zone because of that. But anything in that hot zone, it's always divisions. So we can always have a medical group, a rehab group, a decon group, all of those can occur, but those are always in the cool zone. Always divisions, and always divisions inside because we need geographical. I need to know exactly where you are if something bad goes down. Then finally, this zone hands itself perfectly with when we're operating either offensive or defensive. If we're in the offensive mode, where are we putting people? Into the hot zone. So when we're offensive, we're putting people into the hot zone. When we're defensive, where are we not putting people? In the hot zone. What is the IC's number one priority when they go from offensive to defensive and ensure that no one is where? Where do I need to get a par to make sure that no one's operating it? Yeah, that's where, that's, that's the beauty of it. Now, is there the possibility that be both offensive and defensive on a fire? Yeah, we got a strip mall, right? We got a strip mall. The first unit we are defensive on. We are then offensive in exposure alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three. 
That's just broadcasted. Where hey, we're defensive in the structure in the unit of origin, and we're offensive on the exposures. Okay, all of us. And what does that tell us? We're not putting anybody in that hot zone, but we're putting people in the exposures for, you know, for extension and loss control. Does that make sense? Now, basic, basic fire scope, but understand that we should all understand that our fires are broke down into zones, much of what we're doing right now, but it's up to the IC to determine where, when the zones change, and it's very clear what we should be doing in each one of the zones. All right, the last slide is just that final piece, the communication model is that command transfer between the IC number one, IC number two, that mobile command position to the strategic command. And so there's two pieces of that. You can look on your um, tactical worksheet there, and it kind of summarizes that at the bottom of the page. Kind of in order, right? You got that initial radio report, your follow-up report, we're assigning those five units. You can see your uh, roof report on there. And then we finally get to that final piece, which is the transfer command. And so there's the informal person where that battalion chief, they arrive on scene physically, they have to be there. And then they check in with the mobile command. They say something like, um, I see battalion one, I think I understand that you're performing fire attack and primary search on the alpha side and you've got truck one on the roof I'm performing a roof assessment and you've got squad one establishing a rig cache and controlling utilities. If that's correct, give me a can. And then they come back, chief, that's correct. Battalion one, I see that's correct. Um, I have no needs, resources, we can stay in the offensive strategy. Copy that, I got it from out here. And then they turn around and do a formal transfer command with dispatch. Uh, so just Riverside, Battalion 1, I'm assuming command of the Main Street IC, um, and then just those points. Um, I'm assuming command, we can stay in the offensive strategy, and I'd like to request two additional engine companies. I have no other needs or no other resource requests. And that's it. Now they've done that informal piece, you've confirmed it with the mobile command, hey, you've got what you've got, you've got your tactical objectives, I'm going to assume command, I don't have any other needs, or you have your needs met, and then now it's just on the IC to manage the rest of the incident. And that ends kind of like the communication piece. Anything beyond that is just everything that we've just stated before. Our tactical objectives achieved, we use a can. We either fire control, we've got knocked down and fire, fire control, losses stop. Um, all clears on our primary, secondary, um, and then just the rest of our communication pieces. Uh, status changes, priority traffic, emergency traffic, mandate traffic. And um, that is it. And that rounds out the communication model. So what's next? Like, in, in our minds, we thought, when, a, when we were doing this PowerPoint, we thought, oh, you know, we're going to, breeze through this thing, and then we'll be able to get to some sets of routes, some practice, get through, like reiterate that initial radio report, do a follow-up report, and assign our first alarm to sign it. That was our goal today. But after the first session, we quickly realized that that just wasn't realistic. So from here, we're just taking this opportunity to kind of round out you know, what we're doing, that whole communication model, and then looking forward, we're going to move into sets and reps, that practice period. And Brian talked on that, you know, those MCD groups, probably six or seven, however it's going to be, depending on what we're practicing, we're going to bring it in and have a bunch of computers, headsets, radios, tactical worksheets. We just got the whiteboard, so we'll pass those out and uh, we'll be off to the races. Um, so that's the next phase. After we get enough practice, and we're not sure how long that's gonna take at this point. It can go quickly, and it's really kind of dependent on how well we absorb it. Um, we can kind of keep the momentum, get enough practice, feel confident with it. The next phase is we'll be testing. And the testing is just testing in five different structures. That residential structure, multifamily dwelling or apartment complex, commercial structure, a strip mall, and then a big box. 
And the reason why we have the big box or the uh, five different structures is because that encompasses 95% of all structure fires in the U.S. All the incidents that we respond to as far as structure fires involve mostly one of those five structures. And so showing confidence in the IC number one and IC number two is going to be our goal. Testing, as soon as we get through all those five structures, and if you're good to go and we're doing test number one, it's like boom, boom, you're done. And then uh, we move on to the next structure. Boom, boom, you're done. And then it's just a matter of recertification after that. Yeah. And understand that our BCs are going to be a huge part of this because they are going to be our IC number two. We understand that and they are going to be a part of that. And obviously you're going to be the one that they're, you're going to be working for. And, and I hope we all realize that this, the success of this program is entirely dependent upon uh, uh, RPCs. They're going to be the ones that uh, support the program, drive the program, and in a way enforce the program. So this is dependent upon them. And uh, you know, we've had all of them so far on board here today. Not that we're on board, but they are, they have been an integral part of this today. Both of your BCs were here on the morning session, uh, you know, with support and adding to the conversation. And you know, yesterday, and then we're going to finish this up tomorrow. So. I would always like to, to end any of our classes with a little bit of discussion. You know, I know it's 410 when you ask for questions, there's, it's crickets, right? <laughs> you know, the best part of the class is the last minute of the class. But we're going to do a, we're going to go round table and we're going to ask each, each person, uh, you know, individually. Remember, today is the day. And if there is something that, that's lingering in your mind, how this works, why are we doing this, uh, today's the day because the hope is, and not the hope, but we will be moving forward at our next session. So, Mr. Morris, we'll start with you back there. Uh, the only quick question I had was, as far as the literature backing up all these these tactics and yeah. whatnot, does that mean like, still yeah. be anything that works? And Man, and I tell you what, I'm sure that's what this is the easy part. I'm not gonna this is the easy part. The, the, the tough part is going to be uh, addressing all the SOPs. We've all looked through our SOPs. We know that when you touch one little piece of this SOP, it's attached to a little bit of this SOP, SOP and ultimately, we have the, the practical labs, we have all of this and the layers of it. Um, definitely in the works. I, I don't want to like say that I'm overworked and this is a huge project, but this is a huge project. Yeah. We will get through this and then we will clean up all the SOPs uh, that, that are associated with it. Our hope is that we don't want confusion, we don't want things that contradict. Uh, I would hope that what we're telling you now is what we're going to do and know that the SOPs are going to be cleaned up behind us. We got some antiquated SOPs we're trying to work on them on a daily, and we will commit as much as we can to get everything as clean as possible. What you're probably going to see is a chapter that's dedicated to command and control, uh, knowing that this is this has a bunch of moving pieces, and uh, and that's what we're kind of working on, and that and try to clean up a lot of those pieces. So. And Dave, just to kind of add to what what your question question was and what, what Brian was saying is you know that your question is is not a new one yeah. and it's a question that blue card since its inception have been getting from day one and so that command if I can just get a little historical complex that uh, command book that we that is the model for NFPA NFPA looked at that and modeled everything so if you look at what we do right now, or maybe what we've done in, in years past, we're not compliant with some of the things that they suggest we do. One of the, one of the pieces is just the training piece. And they suggest that we need a training piece that ensures competence and have a easy access training piece that everybody can access, it brings everybody up to, that's what this is. Um, you know, we've already mentioned kind of like the hot warm zone. That is straight from fire scope from NFPA. They say that we don't do that right now, but we are going to do that. And there's lots of other pieces when you kind of look at them. You know, the IDLH, the um, error management, the accountability piece, like all these little pieces. Well, we do a good job. If you were to kind of pick it apart and dissect it, we would be able to easily kind of find. Some of the, that was one of my little pet projects. It's like go through, you know, these things and like, hey, is, it, is that true? Well, let me get out the NFPA book, look through it. Oh, it says this. Well, let me look up fire scope. Let me look, well, it actually says this. Or let me look at this piece and say, we're saying this, but is that true? Well, 
it actually says this. And so I, I'm pretty confident in saying that, yes, it does meet all those requirements and, exceed, and exceeds them. And if by anything incorporating this into our department, we're bringing our level up to that standard if we're saying that is our standard. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. What you got, Ryan? So from this point forward, we can be expected to use this communication and accountability. I think, you know, we have all, all of our BCs here. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Moving mm -hmm. forward, we're, we're going to move higher. We're, the department is committed to it. So, it you know, so as you leave here today, that's the expectation. And just to kind of round out, I don't know if it'll ever, ever happen. You know, it's kind of always like, hey, can we fit this in? Can we do it? Is it something that's feasible? But along with kind of like the sets and reps and then the testing, we wrote a 1410. Whether we can do it or not, we're not quite sure. But the 1410 was focused in on um, physical application and practice of the communication model. If we aren't getting it up in the real world setting, we can do a multi company drill where units arrive, you know, on the fire training ground or controlled setting and show up and actually communicate on the radio, actually pull a line to a problem area, communicate that we got knocked down of the fire, practice that communication piece without having an actual hazard, but just kind of doing the whole thing in its totality. So we have that in its works, whether we can actually kind of get it going and do it will be another matter, but um, that's, that's, that's the goal. Yeah. What you got, Brian? This is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. We just got to learn it and study it and make sure we're proficient at it. And, uh, for me, the hardest part is learning one thing for 17 years and now adjusting my terminology and, yeah, and moving forward. That's all it is. But I mean, as long as we're going to hold that standard from test time, so to speak. Yeah. The, you know, I know SOPs may not get changed, but if this is what we're doing, this is what we're doing. It's fine. Hundred percent. You know, we had a. Uh, we kind of use that old dog, new dog mentality, new tricks, and we got some old dogs, right? And we got some old dogs that do really good. You know, at three in the morning, they touch that button on the radio and everything just comes out perfect. Half asleep and, and uh, yeah, there's gonna be a little bit of reprogramming, but I think if we looked over your last 17 years, there's been quite a few different reprograms. And then, and yeah, we'll, uh, we'll get it's a big one for me though. It is a big one, it's a bigger one, right? This one's a tough one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the only question I have was that when I discussed with you guys at the break was just the clarification on the fault uh, radar report um, on the 360, you know, the TAC, which is on the current channel. So put that up and understand the uh, the essence of it. So moving forward, just make sure it's on the TAC. And you know, just Tony's question is we're always going to have struggles with a two frequency system. And what do I do? I do my follow up report on the command channel or the TAC channel. And I think we can all agree that. The TAC channel is the not the it's not the best case scenario, but it's the best of the two. Because that information that we need to be broadcasted is for the if there's anything critical, it's for the people that are operating on TAC at that moment. And then we can update everybody else accordingly. Now I guess the only we know we can we can find the holes and everything. You're the first new engine, no one else is on scene. Who are you giving it to yourself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I guess and then but where I also believe that all of us when we got some incredibly smart people that I'm not gonna get on the radio and give the report to myself. You know, that if I'm first do that much and I'm giving a 360 board, and then I also believe that, and we do this every day, if there is something major and critical that I need everybody to know on this incident, responding to this incident at the command center or at the dispatch center at their stations, we'll make sure that word gets out. Frank, what do you got? Uh, you said this is our fire control sheet. Is this gonna replace the blue one? I think this will ultimately replace this. Uh, now, remember, this is this has like three functions. It is a training tool. It is a um, it's the training tool that we can use. It is in alignment with the, the coursework that we're going to do here for the sets and reps, and it definitely can be used as a control sheet for everything that we're expecting to do on the scene. Now, understand that our instrument control sheets also have you know all those other variables that are that build the incident, right? Uh, the uh, you know other things that we're requesting utilities uh, uh, PD and everything. This is the uh, this is the communication module uh, template. Now this communication template could be perfect for that, and then also augment the control sheets. Yeah, exactly. 
Okay, so first of all, these will get in, in Target Solutions, there's a folder that says blue card. Everything that we, everything, this PowerPoint and those will be in the blue card folder. Uh, by the time we get here, our next session, next month from right now, you will all be given a, a dry erase board with them. And you think COVID's bad, right? There is a worldwide shortage of dry erase boards. <laughs> That's why we wanted them. We, we ordered them a long time ago. And they said we can't get them because there is a worldwide shortage of dry erase boards. And we actually got them today, so I don't know. Maybe COVID's doing better. We, we they were able to fill the order, so. We say it in joking, but that, that's where they'll be looking. Why don't you guys fill out and fill the occupancy types since we're talking about the five, so it's 95% of the calls. How much you guys fill those out? Oh, it's a, like a circle instead of just like the label on it? Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, maybe the, yeah, maybe the next iteration. Uh, we just put the line there so you can just you know write it. Yeah. Now remember, uh, when it comes to occupancy type though, you're, we're not going to, remember when we did that report on conditions, we want you to tell us what occupancy type it is. So we don't want to hear big box. We want to hear, remember that just very clear text, whatever it is, I'm on a small home. I'm on a small two-story home. I'm on scene of a single story high school. We, we still want to paint that picture. Remember, and that's so important. And then, you know, some of these guys that are incredible with these like crazy terms that they, yeah, man, yeah. I'm on scene of, simple, right? I'm on scene yeah. at Harvest Church. Like, I'm on scene of Ramona High School. I start streamlining and stuff, and a lot of people start talking about a lot of other different things. Yeah. And extravagant and stuff. Yeah. You know, I have no idea what yeah. And that's yeah. when we put that occupancy type, what it is, and we use try to as much as clear as we can. We're going to finish up with you, Chief. Okay. All right. Mr. Avamon, what you got? Um, so we're developing our own program based on blue card. Are we going to create the certification process to be started? Like, if someone is on the engineer's list oh. beforehand? or when they get certified. I like it, no, this is perfect. Hey. And that's why you're here today. That's why you're here today. So obviously, uh, what do we got? You're, uh, you're soon, right? Yes, sir. A month? You're Between assigned. now and January. Between now and January, okay. So you're, the, you're, you're, you're on the bubble, right? So as soon as the engineer list comes out, everybody is assigned to the car. Now we know that some of those people get that job that day, and some of them get it 18 months from there. But day one, our goal is to assign you blue card and then also assign you engine boss. In this perfect ultimate world, the day you promote is that you are already blue card certified as, a, as an all risk incident commander and you're an engine boss training. And front end certified. Yes. <laughs> all yeah. so and all that. The so follow up on that is for testing for engineer, are we going to be held to the standard in the future? Yeah, that is the standard. Okay. Yeah, so, and remember, when we test for engineer, we're not looking for someone to run the most complex incident. We need you to know what a report on conditions is. We know we okay. need you to know what a 3D deployment model is. So yeah, those basic standards will be this. Will, will Start mentoring in this fashion. Yep. And this is the beauty, and I hope that we understand, because it's not hey, this is what Rich Bell taught Brian, or this isn't what hey, I work for up at eleven, so no one is giving me any help. Or that there's, hey, there's the one side of the department or the other side of the department, or I look out. Everybody's working right on this. I tell you, you know, and I won't, I don't always say that that uh, that these blue card uh, departments, but a lot of blue card departments get away from Sims because guess what? Everyone does it identical. They say that there's no evaluation in it anymore. They have you sit in the seat and everybody because by the time you get in the simulation for the promotional exam, guess what? You've already sat that simulation 20 times. You ran through it, so they're like, we don't even do sims anymore for our evaluation process because everybody does it identical. They speak robotic because they were reading off of this uh, communication model. Peter, what do you got? Um, just, just one note, uh, dispatcher sitting in on any of these? Yes, of course, okay. of course. You know, you probably watched the blue card uh, videos, right? And you watched it and you thought to yourself, man, this dispatch component is not going to work for us. <laughs> and we understand that. And we agree. We agree that you know their dispatch is a command center. And we have a dispatch center. We know that those are two different things. They have a, you know, they have a battalion chief in there who's listening to the radio, and they actually own that incident right up until the time that first uh, engine gets on scene. But we're definitely bringing the dispatchers in. They've been here throughout there. What they need to know is what the terms are, right? They need to know what our language is. They need to know when we start using this language, what they mean. 
what is level one is level two. We're gonna, they've been here and we're gonna continue because we know that it's important. Fortunately or unfortunately, we know that their role is to just know our language, uh, but we definitely are gonna get them up to speed so that we're all talking like. Mr. Cortez. I'm glad we addressed the unit uh, 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 half tags. Yes. Because I mean, it's a thing that we take time to do every day. We usually don't use them, and now we have an actual thing to say the engineer is more than likely that are going to be at that unit. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And vice versa, you know, if you're that first two engine, you're going to be, you expect some people coming your way, dropping things off at your seat. Right. And then when you see that BC, you got that peripheral engine, and as soon as you see that, you're taking those things over there because we know that everything revolves around the movement of those tanks. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Just about the yeah, firefighters getting trained on this. You know, squads show up on scene every once in a while first, and they're getting their size up, and um, you don't expect them to get assignments. But are they, is it ever going to roll out in the future, maybe? Yeah. Okay. I definitely roll out in the future, but understand that this training is just not going to occur today in these walls for four hours. Uh, we expect that this goes back to your station, that anything that we learned here today, you discuss with them, that when you're driving around and we're talking about this, uh, we're doing the incremental approach. We get all these officers, but the approach, the, what, and the only way it's going to be successful is that this information gets take back, taken back to the stations, that you discuss it, that you have company schools on it. And that's why all this information will be available, um, and uh, and then the trickle down of it. And they're hearing it, right? So that's part of it. Is just our responsibility of of doing it and being disciplined in our radio communications because our new firefighters. That's what they hear. They hear our example. And while they're on scene, they're listening to the radio just as much as you're listening to the radio or I'm listening to the radio. And that is as much as a training piece as anything. No different than how we were trained yeah. coming up on the old way. It's no different. It's just teaching yep. them how to do an assignment and what you want, how you want. Yeah. It's a good point. Your unit's The only thing I think that that's going to help us is not only are you just going to have to listen and maybe listen to what's good and what's bad and then have a captain that's going to show you, but you also have a template that you can give to them and that we can run them through the same sims that, that we're going through eventually because eventually, remember, these sims are going to be available. That's that's around. Has everyone taken the PowerPoint yet? Where, where are we? I so this, have, we have. But. Yeah. So every, every chief, every captain, every engineer, and everybody on the engineers list has, has a subscription. Perfect. So everybody had that is or has the potential to very soon be an officer has a subscription. Uh, that last group that, that you just pushed through, uh, they've all been assigned. Uh, and I think most of them have, have already dove into it. And then like Miguel, I think you're one of those, obviously. Yeah. Um, so obviously my only recommendation to you is to get through it as, as quick as possible, mm -hmm. knowing that the quicker you get through that information, the quicker you have to speed. And it's only 40 hours or so. I just want to say to you guys, and I, I've said it a couple of times, the department has officially embraced this. Um, we're making a change. Embrace it. We're going to it. Um, as you leave here today, use it. Um, I encourage you to use it. I'm listening to the radio more now than ever. Um, as we evolve, it's my expectation that it's going to be used. If not, I'm going to be asking why not. Um, this is the standard moving forward. Um, I'm excited about it. I think five years from now, we're going to be better for it. Um, it's going to make us safer, more proficient. Those are the things I learned. Any questions? Great questions, too, but you know, I encourage you guys to continue to ask questions. You know, there's going to be questions that pop up, but let's perfect it. We appreciate that. You know, obviously, Chief, that is everything that we need is that guidance and that leadership to go forward. Remember, every one of our VCs, they're the great resource. Scott and I don't think that we're the experts on this. The only reason that we're up here and why we think we might be the subject matter experts is because we got to teach and we just read the thing frontwards and backwards. So reach out if you have any questions to your VCs. Obviously, reach out to Scott and I, Chief Delore. We're always here. Appreciate your time. Oh, as always, 
always got to stress those training hours. Uh, we need to ensure that we put it in uh, on target solutions on the dashboard. It'll be 2021 officer training session number one. Ensure that you put your crew and anybody who was on your crew that attended here today. Got to pay for those whiteboards. Got to pay for those whiteboards. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.